Most internal combustion engines have intake valves that allow the fuel and air mixture to enter the cylinder and exhaust valves to let exhaust gases out. Overhead valve or pushrod engines as they're commonly known and overhead cam engines all have intake and exhaust valves. The main difference between the two is the location of the camshaft that actuates the valves. In a pushrod engine, the camshaft is located low in the engine, close to the crankshaft. The crank drives a chain that turns the cam. Then the cam lobes move the lifters that push the pushrods, that push the rockers, that open the valves. In an overhead cam engine, the camshaft is located in the cylinder head, on top of or next to the valves. In an OHC engine, the crank drives a chain that turns the cam like in the pushrod engine, but that's where the similarity ends. In some designs, the cam sits on top of the valves, with the cam lobes pushing the valves open directly. But in most of the modern designs, the cam lobe pushes a rocker that opens the valve. It becomes pretty obvious that the big difference between pushrod engines and overhead cam is the number of valve train parts. The fewer number of parts in an OHC application translates to less valve train weight, and saving weight, as we all know, translates to making more power. There are many other reasons that make OHC engines a popular high-performance choice. Things like reduced valve train weight and components mean higher RPM limits and less vibration for smoother operation. Without pushrod tubes in the way, intake ports can be straighter for higher airflow and configurations with three or more valves per cylinder are possible. All this improved efficiency also means more horsepower output per cubic inch of displacement. So for the contemporary car designer, this translated into smaller and lighter OHC engines than their OHV counterparts with comparable power. Overhead cam engines come in two forms, the SOHC, single overhead cam, and the DOHC, double overhead cam. SOHC engines typically have the basic two valve per cylinder, but sometimes may have three valves per cylinder. The DOHC engine has two cams per head, one intake cam and one exhaust cam. The big advantage with the DOHC is the ability to have at least four valves per cylinder. As with everything, there are always compromises and trade-offs, and the difference between single and double overhead cam engines is no different. The single cammers, as they're called, for the most part, operate in basically the same RPM ranges as their overhead valve counterparts with similar torque and horsepower profiles. DOHC engines, however, with four valves per cylinder, rev to much higher red lines and flow quite a bit more than their two-valve brethren. The trade-offs, though, are increased expense, twice as many valves, springs, and cams, and the fact that due to higher airflow, four valve engines make their peak power at higher RPMs. The compromise? Well, more power on the top end means less torque at the bottom, so four valve performance and race engines need to operate at much higher RPM levels than two valve engines to be efficient. Now, European and Japanese car makers have featured the more compact overhead cam engines in their smaller cars for a number of years. But stateside, Ford Motor Company is the American manufacturer that has made the biggest commitment to this high-efficiency technology. Ford introduced the 4.6-liter SOHC engine in the full-size Crown Victoria in 1991. A DOHC high-performance version of the 4.6-liter appeared in the 1993 Lincoln Mark 8. In 1996, the new 4.6-liter engine package found its way into the cornerstone of affordable American performance cars, the Mustang. The Mustang GT sported the 4.6-liter SOHC with two valves per cylinder, while the hot Mustang Cobra featured a new high-performance version of the DOHC. When the famous Ford Flathead V8 debuted in 1932 during the Great Depression, it revolutionized the way V8 engines were produced. In fact, up till then, V8 engines were relatively rare, appearing only in high-priced cars. Why? Because they were expensive, requiring multiple castings and tedious bench assembly. Henry Ford changed all that when he dictated to his engineers that the new Ford V8 would be a single casting, something that was considered impossible at the time. But through sheer force and in a matter of months, 
Henry drove his engineers to do the impossible. And when the 32 Ford V8 replaced the aging Model A, a legend was born. The original flathead displaced 221 cubic inches and produced 65 horsepower. Henry's trademark was simplicity, and the new flathead was a marvel of simplicity, from its single block casting, which included the bell housing, to its famous flathead design. Now why do they call it a flathead? Because the valves are located in the cylinder block alongside the piston, instead of overhead in the cylinder head, allowing the head to be flat in appearance. The flathead is also known as an L-head because the combustion chamber forms an L-shape with the chamber extending over the valves. One advantage of a flathead is the small number of moving parts required to open and close the valves. Drawbacks include poor breathing characteristics by today's standards and limitations on increasing compression ratios. The flathead V8 powered Fords for 22 years and was replaced by a modern overhead valve design in 1954. Early post-war hot rodders loved the Ford flathead V8. It was inexpensive, ubiquitous, and made a good platform for modifications. As we mentioned earlier, the flatheads are also known as L-heads because of their L-shaped combustion chamber. Modern overhead valve designs are more efficient but the flathead does have a few advantages. Because of its simple design and lack of push rods and rocker arms, the flathead doesn't create as much internal friction. Less friction means less horsepower being wasted on opening and closing the valves. There are two basic combustion chamber configurations for flatheads, the low compression non-turbulent design and the higher compression squish type used on the V8. The non-turbulent design has one large combustion chamber area which allows a high volume of air-fuel mixture to enter. The major drawback is this design does not allow for high compression ratios. Ford used this non-turbulent design on the four-cylinder Model A engine, which had a compression ratio of about 4 to 1. The squish-type combustion chamber design was used on the flathead V8. It reduced the overall volume of the combustion chamber by reducing the area above the piston, which created higher compression ratios. The early flathead V8 had ratios of about 6 to 1. The squish-type design has relatively efficient combustion because high-velocity turbulent flow characteristics are created by valve location and the tapered head over the piston. The cam is the mechanical brain of an engine. In simplest terms, it tells the valves what to do, when to do it, and for how long. So picking a camshaft for your long block is arguably the most important decision you'll make. In our limited time today, we'll introduce you to some basic considerations. First, ask yourself two questions. What RPM range will the engine spend most of its time in? And how much am I willing to trade for reliability and lack of maintenance? Next, consider the power curve you'd like the engine to produce. For most of us, it will come down to selecting a cam that will give us the right balance between streetability and high RPM horsepower. In terms of the power curve, there are three main points to consider. Valve lift, valve duration, and cam timing. Valve lift is how far the valve opens in relationship to the valve seat and is measured in thousandths of an inch. Valve duration is how long the valve stays open and is measured in degrees of crankshaft rotation. The greater the lift and duration, the greater the flow in and out of the combustion chamber. Cam timing determines when valves open and close in relationship to the piston. But when it comes to cam design, it really comes down to the shape of the lobes on the cam and their relationship to each other. So a cam with a very tall lobe provides a lot of lift and a lobe with a broad tip provides a lot of duration. Another important consideration is valve overlap, or the time when both the exhaust and intake valves are open at the same time. This occurs when the exhaust valve closes late and the intake valve opens early. The effect is called scavenging. It's a vacuum that speeds up exhaust gases leaving the cylinder and air fuel entering. The scavenging effect is very pronounced at higher RPM and allows an engine to generate more power. All this sounds like you should select a cam that provides maximum lift, duration and overlap if you want to make big power. And this is the trap most beginners fall into. 
Unless you're building an all-out race engine, moderation is the best policy. Our advice is to call the cam manufacturers. They can help you select a cam based on your needs and budget. The valve train in a push rod engine is more complicated than it appears. In our limited time today, we'd like to cover a few key parts. After you've selected your camshaft, you'll want to select lifters, also known as tappets, that match your selection. There are two basic types, solid or mechanical, and hydraulic. A solid lifter rides on the cam lobe and transfers lift directly to the push rod through a solid piece of metal. Solid lifters are noisy and must be adjusted periodically because a small gap must be maintained between the push rod and the rocker arm to allow for wear and temperature changes. A hydraulic lifter uses pressurized engine oil to keep all the play out of the valve train. They operate quietly and don't need to be adjusted. However, hydraulic lifters have rev limitations, so in high revving race engines, solid lifters are the ticket. Lifters also have two types of tips, flat and roller. A flat tip is slightly curved and slides along the cam lobe. A roller tip rolls along the profile of the lobe and reduces friction and wear. Another important player in the valve train is the rocker arm. The rocker arm pivots to transfer motion from the push rod to the valve stem. It also multiplies the movement because the valve stem side of the rocker is longer than the push rod side. This difference is called the rocker ratio and is important in determining the performance characteristics of an engine because the higher the ratio, the more valve lift and duration you'll have. On a stock engine, the ratio may be 1.5 to 1. A performance engine may have a rocker ratio of 1.6 or higher. Fuel injection. Over the last 20 years, it's wiped out the use of carburetors on new cars and trucks. Why? Because it's much more efficient than a carburetor and meets the government's emission requirements. A fuel injection system uses a fuel pump to pressurize fuel and then inject it into the air intake of an engine. The fuel is then atomized as it mixes with the airstream. So as you can see, it performs the same function as a carburetor, except pressure, and not vacuum, is used to introduce the fuel into the airstream. This makes fuel injection more efficient at atomizing fuel than a carburetor. There are two popular methods of controlling the amount of fuel being injected into the airstream, electronic and mechanical. Today we are talking about the most common type, electronic fuel injection, or EFI. Mechanical fuel injection is what you'll find on sprint cars, top fuel dragsters, and old school hot rods. Now there are two basic classifications of fuel injection found on most cars and trucks. The first and simplest type is throttle body injection. Here, a throttle body is bolted onto the intake manifold in place of a carburetor. Inside, one or more injectors spray fuel into the air horn, and it mixes with the air as it flows into the intake manifold. Multiport injection places multiple injectors in the individual intake ports, so the fuel is mixed with the air right before it enters each cylinder. Multiport injection allows for more precise air fuel mixing than throttle body injection and provides more power and better emissions control. Multiport injection is used on new cars and trucks. Electronic fuel injection has four subsystems fuel, air, sensor, and computer control. The fuel system delivers fuel to the injectors and consists of a fuel pump and filter, a pressure regulator, fuel injectors, and lines and hoses. The air system delivers air to the intake manifold and consists of an air filter, throttle valves, sensors, and ductwork. The sensor system monitors operating conditions and then sends the data to the engine control module. The sensors monitor everything from air inlet temperature to exhaust oxygen levels. The last subsystem, the computer control system, uses the data from the sensors to precisely control the amount of fuel delivered by the injectors and the amount of air entering the intake. The brain of the computer control system is the engine control module, a pre-programmed microcomputer. All of these subsystems work together to make electronic fuel injection the most efficient way to deliver fuel to your engine, while providing better starting and idle characteristics.
Carburetors in one form or another have been used on engines since the dawn of the internal combustion age. Over the years they've become more complicated but their basic operation hasn't changed since around 1900 when the jet inventory system carb was first developed. So how does a carb work? Here are the basics. A carb uses vacuum that's created by the pistons on their intake stroke to draw outside air into the barrel of the carb. The air then passes through the venturi, where the narrowed shape increases airspeed, forming a strong low pressure area, or suction, in the barrel. The suction draws liquid fuel out of the main fuel nozzle and atomizes it. The air-fuel mixture is then drawn into the intake manifold, and then the cylinders. The main fuel nozzle is connected to a fuel bowl that stores a supply of non-pressurized fuel. The rate at which the air-fuel mixture is entering the intake manifold is controlled by a throttle valve, also called a butterfly, located at the base of the carb. Some carbs, particularly performance carbs, have double venturi to make fuel atomization even more efficient. Performance carbs also have multiple barrels, with the most common setup having four barrels. The additional barrels simply allow for more airflow, for more power. Typically, a carb size is measured in CFM, or cubic feet per minute of airflow. Earlier, we talked about the basics of how a carb works. But carbs are fairly complicated devices with several systems working together to deliver the right air-fuel mixture under all operating conditions. Our basic explanation earlier described one of the systems called the main metering system. This system operates when the engine is running at high enough RPM to create sufficient vacuum to draw fuel from the main fuel nozzle. In addition, some two-barrel and all four-barrel carbs have a secondary main metering system that phases in when the throttle is at or near wide open. On a four-barrel carb, the rear two barrels are secondaries. But a carb needs several other systems to work properly. When vacuum is low, the idle and off-idle systems are active. The idle system introduces fuel just below the throttle valve when it is closed and airflow is restricted in the Venturi area. This system is used at about 900 RPM or below. The off-idle system feeds fuel into the airstream when the throttle valve is partially open, but still not open enough for the main metering system to operate. The accelerator system squirts fuel into the airstream to compensate for the temporary lean condition created when the throttle valve is being opened and air rushes in quicker than fuel can be delivered. The full power system richens up the fuel mixture during a full throttle, full power condition. The other two carb systems are the float and choke systems. The float system, as Cam and Dean so eloquently described, works like the float in the back of your toilet. It keeps the fuel pump from pumping too much fuel into the fuel bowl and operates with a float and needle valve setup. The choke system restricts the amount of air entering the barrel under cold starting conditions when fuel does not atomize well and the engine is likely to miss or even stall. Carburetor manufacturers have their own carb designs and terminology, but they all operate using the same basic principles. Most production engines are designed to have a normal operating temperature between 180 and 210 degrees Fahrenheit. It's in this temperature range that the engine runs most efficiently, but keeping it there is no small task, since temperatures in the combustion chamber can reach 4200 degrees or more. So it's up to the cooling system to keep the engine in its normal operating range, so that excessive heat doesn't damage the engine. Most automotive cooling systems are liquid type. The typical system includes a radiator, various hoses, a water pump, thermostat, cooling fan, heater core, and coolant. Coolant is a mixture of antifreeze and water. Inside the engine, a series of water jackets circulate coolant near the combustion chambers. The coolant absorbs heat from the chambers as it passes by. Then it flows out of the engine and into the radiator, a large water-to-air heat exchanger that cools the coolant before it begins its journey into the engine again. A cooling fan helps increase the cooling effect of the radiator by increasing the airflow moving through it. The water pump is the heart of the system and pumps the coolant through the system. The heater core is a heat exchanger and uses the hot coolant to warm air so the passenger compartment can be kept warm. 
During starting, when the engine's cooling system is below normal operating temperature, the thermostat blocks the flow of coolant to the radiator. This allows the engine to warm more quickly. At a predetermined temperature, the thermostat opens and allows the coolant to flow to the radiator. In a conventional setup, hot coolant flows from the cylinder heads into the radiator and then back into the block of the engine. Many high-performance engines use what's called a reverse flow. Here, cooled coolant leaves the radiator and flows into the head, and then exits the block of the engine and returns to the radiator. Radiators have two basic designs. In the downflow design, coolant from the engine enters at the top and then flows down cooling tubes called the core that run vertically and exits at the bottom on its way back to the engine. In a cross-flow radiator, the coolant enters from the top and flows horizontally through the cooling tubes before exiting at the bottom. Up until the 1970s, cars used what's called an open cooling system. In an open system, when the coolant is hot and expands, a pressure valve inside the radiator cap would open and superheated coolant would exit the system through an overflow tube. This coolant would be dumped on the ground and was not very environmentally friendly. In a closed system, a coolant reservoir catches the coolant that is expelled through the radiator cap. When the engine cools and additional coolant is required to keep the system filled properly, a vacuum valve in the radiator cap opens and allows coolant from the reservoir to be drawn back into the system. Today, new car radiators are made of aluminum. Aluminum has two major advantages over older copper brass construction. Aluminum is lighter and stronger. Copper brass naturally dissipates heat better, but because of the strength of aluminum, the cooling tubes are much wider in aluminum radiators, making them just as efficient at cooling as copper brass radiators while weighing less. Cars equipped with automatic transmissions will typically have a transmission fluid cooler located inside the radiator. Fluid is pumped from the transmission through a small tank mounted inside one of the radiator's main tanks. Transmission fluid operating temperatures are much hotter than radiator temperatures, so the hot radiator coolant actually cools the transmission fluid. In a cross-flow radiator, the transmission cooler is located on the radiator cap side. In a downflow design, the transmission cooler tank is located at the bottom. Transmission coolers are sometimes mounted outside of the radiator. Many high-performance engines have an oil cooler. This heat exchanger looks like a small radiator and uses airflow to cool engine oil. In a common setup, an oil line delivers oil from the oil filter casing to the oil cooler, and then another oil line returns it to the oil filter unit. New car manufacturers don't tune production cars to perform at their limits, mainly due to emission and fuel economy regulations. But thanks to the efforts of the performance aftermarket, we can. All late model cars are controlled by computers. So whether your car is stock or it's been modified, all that's required to tune your car is a basic knowledge of how onboard computers work and what they control. A computer finds outputs by using electronic circuits to analyze input information. Or simply put, it's the brain of the car. The auto manufacturers have referred to their computers by several different names, including Central Processing Unit (CPU), Control Unit, or Control Module and Microprocessor. Since their first appearance on new cars about 20 years ago, they've gotten faster and now control almost every function of a new car. Today's new cars generally have a main computer located under the dash or seat and then several other single-function computers located throughout the car that control everything from anti-lock brakes to instrumentation. The computers gather information from numerous sensors and calculate responses to sensor data based on pre-programmed information. These responses are then sent to what are called actuators located throughout the car that make adjustments to the way the car is performing at any point in time. The early onboard computers, referred to as electronic control modules or ECMs, used a microprocessor and a programmable read-only memory or PROM for calibration that contained specific engine, powertrain and vehicle information. These PROMs are commonly referred to as chips and they were not erasable so they could not be reprogrammed. But it didn't take long for the aftermarket to design and sell performance chips that replaced the stock chip. 
This allowed owners to tune their cars by giving the computer new calibration guidelines that produced more horsepower and torque. Several years ago, the auto industry switched to faster, more powerful computers commonly referred to as electronic control units, or ECUs. In an ECU, non-erasable PROMs have been replaced by flash-erasable programmable read-only memory, called FEEPROM. You'll hear these new computers called flashable because they can be reprogrammed or tuned at any time. We'll talk more about today's flashable computers later in the show. As we discussed earlier, today's computers are referred to as flashable because they can be reprogrammed at any time. And what more could we performance enthusiasts ask for than being able to fine-tune our late model car to make more horsepower, shift how and when we want, and so on? Is technology great or what? Reprogramming onboard computers became a reality when auto manufacturers developed what's known as onboard diagnostics to allow mechanics to quickly diagnose a problem with a car and to help meet emissions regulations. The first generation of onboard diagnostics is referred to as OBD1, and the second generation is referred to as OBD2. Today, mechanics can quickly access computers by plugging a scan tool into a diagnostic port and retrieve error codes and other information that tells them what the problem is with the car. They can also reprogram the flashable memory of the computer if need be. Reprogramming? We car enthusiasts call that tuning. Thanks again to the aftermarket, we can purchase handheld controllers that allow us to plug into the diagnostic port and reprogram onboard computers ourselves. Fuel tables, transmission shift points, speed limits, and so on can all be changed in a matter of seconds. Want to take your car to the track this weekend? Easy. Just dial in the settings you want and race your heart out. When you're done, simply reset the computer to the daily driver settings. It really is that easy. So whether you have an older, non-flashable computer on your car that requires changing a chip, or whether you have the latest flashable computer, you still have the freedom to tune your car for optimal performance. All piston engines rely on two basic design ingredients to define themselves, bore and stroke. The piston lives inside the bore, and the distance it moves within that bore is called the stroke. Both the bore size and the length of the stroke account for the engine's displacement, and both of these elements carry distinct characteristics based on their dimensions. The bore diameter is responsible for harnessing the power created in the combustion chamber. As the chamber fires and the air-fuel mixture expands rapidly, the piston is forced down into the bore. The larger the bore is, the greater the force can be pushing the piston down. The stroke relates to how far the piston can be pushed down in turning the crankshaft. It also defines displacement and works like a handle in propelling the crankshaft. The longer the stroke is, the more torque potential there is in the engine design. It would seem to any hot rodder that maximizing both bore and stroke would result in the largest engine and therefore the most power. Technically, this is true. However, enlarging the bore and lengthening the stroke have some engineering drawbacks. When an engine ignites the air-fuel mixture in the combustion chamber, the flame must travel across the bore to ignite all of the compressed air and fuel in the chamber. Naturally, this takes time to occur. A large bore requires more time for the burning process to occur, and this will have an impact on the ignition timing. In fact, research has shown that in most common applications, a bore ceiling of around four and a half inches is about as large as you should go to maintain a complete burn on pump gas. If the bore is too large, the piston will not have sufficient time at top dead center to burn the mixture effectively and make the most of its design potential. The stroke length is also a compromise. Certainly, we're enthusiastic to want the longest stroke possible to maximize displacement, but the penalties must be addressed. The longer stroke will deliver increased torque, but the longer throws on the crankshaft and the longer connecting rods or pistons required to work in concert with it all weigh more. When we're talking about a rotating assembly, weight is our enemy and will restrict the ability of the rotating assembly to spin faster and make more power. 
These weights all multiply dramatically with RPM, so we must find a happy medium between rotating mass and stroke length. The correct stroke for your project is determined by many factors, but the weight of the vehicle receiving the engine is a big part of it. A heavier vehicle will require a nice long stroke to move effectively from a standing start or to pull hard out of a corner. The RPM capability of such an engine may be limited by the heavy rotating mass, so the other parts of the engine that are RPM sensitive, like the camshaft, cylinder head ports, and intake manifold design, should all be designed around the RPM capability of the engine. Luckily, aftermarket manufacturers know the benefits of long strokes and the importance of lightweight rotating assemblies. So many aftermarket stroker cranks undergo extensive lightening procedures. This gives some of the RPM capability back to the engine, but it still takes time for the crank to go through a longer stroke. Again, careful research and teaming of components can result in tremendous performance. Most full race cars are lightweight, so most of the professional racing engines we see are big bore short stroke combinations that have the capability to run and breathe freely at high RPM. For the street, we don't normally see very high RPM, and our cars are usually quite heavy when compared to race cars, so a little extra stroke doesn't hurt. Owners of the 383-inch Chevy small blocks, which are stroked 350s, would agree that having more stroke on the street is always a good thing. Engine builders have found that a low-compression stroker engine designed to run on pump gas is the best way to improve street performance. The larger cubic inches and increased mechanical advantage provided by the longer stroke increase the torque available to move heavy muscle cars off the line or out of a corner quicker. And that's precisely what we're after. Superchargers have been increasing the horsepower of internal combustion engines for about a hundred years. The purpose of the supercharger is to force feed an engine a greater amount of air by creating boost pressure. Boost pressure can be created a number of different ways. Vacuum and boost are opposite sides of the coin when it comes to producing power. In a normally aspirated engine, vacuum is created when the pistons move downward in the cylinders and create a negative pressure area. Ambient pressure inside the intake manifold is drawn into the cylinder and compression begins once the intake valve closes and the piston begins to move up. Boost, however it may be created, creates a higher than ambient pressure zone inside the intake manifold. So when the intake valve opens, the air-fuel mixture is forced inside the cylinder at a greater rate. The difference between the ambient pressure and the boost pressure is normally read in pounds. Once boost is created, it's possible for an engine to be more than 100% efficient, since the artificial means of cylinder filling is exceeding the natural vacuum capabilities of the engine. Today, we're focusing on the centrifugal type supercharger as a means of pumping power into our engines. The centrifugal supercharger is a belt-driven compressor that operates like a turbocharger except it's driven by a belt and not exhaust gases. High-speed turbine blades rotate at about 40,000 RPM or more to generate boost pressure. Centrifugal superchargers are known as dynamic compressors because they produce boost by accelerating air to a high velocity and then slow it down by using diffusion. A set of gears located on the back side of the turbine provide the gear ratio necessary for a low-speed device, the crankshaft, to rotate the compressor, a high-speed device. Air enters the system through the air intake, then flows to the turbine where it's accelerated to produce boost pressure. From the turbine housing, the compressed air speeds its way to the intake manifold or carburetor and eventually into the combustion chambers. Like other superchargers, the amount of boost pressure produced depends on the engine's RPM. A typical street setup might make 8 PSI of pressure at, say, 5,500 RPM, but only 3 PSI at 2,500 RPM. 
One of the advantages of a centrifugal supercharger over a turbocharger is in heat production. A turbocharger produces heat in two ways. First, because it uses exhaust gases to drive the turbine, the turbocharger itself reaches a very high temperature. Second, when air is compressed, it produces heat as a byproduct. With a supercharger, you only have the latter to deal with. The increased temperature of compressed air also robs the engine of horsepower. One way to increase the horsepower output of a supercharged engine is to install an intercooler. An intercooler is an air-to-air -air heat exchanger that lowers the temperature of the air entering the intake manifold. The compressed air from a supercharger can cause a major problem called detonation. Detonation occurs when the air-fuel mixture does not burn completely and the end gases explode violently. This problem is very common in any engine that's being force-fed by a supercharger. Why? Because filling a combustion chamber with compressed air actually raises the compression ratio. Detonation can damage the engine and produces that familiar knocking sound we've all heard. Today, manufacturers sell complete supercharger kits that greatly reduce the detonation problem. Say the word turbocharger and the pulse quickens and power expectations race out of control. But what exactly is a turbocharger? Here's a quick overview. A turbocharger, like a supercharger, raises the air pressure in the intake manifold and force feeds an engine a greater amount of air-fuel mixture, creating more power. Unlike a supercharger, a turbocharger is powered by exhaust gases instead of by a belt, chain or gears. So a turbo consists of an exhaust gas driven turbine and centrifugal air compressor mounted at the opposite ends of a shaft. Generally, the turbo is mounted near the exhaust manifold. Exhaust gases enter the turbine side and strike the fins of the turbine wheel, causing it to rotate, which in turn rotates the compressor wheel on the other side. As the compressor wheel rotates, intake air pressure increases. This increased air pressure is called boost and is measured in pounds per square inch, or PSI. Turbocharged engines normally require a few modifications, including a lower compression ratio, stronger internals like rods and pistons, larger oil pump and oil cooler, and a larger radiator. Turbos can reach temperatures in excess of 1,600 degrees and rotate at speeds of more than 100,000 RPM. The challenge is to keep the bearings in a turbo well oiled to reduce heat and friction, which is generally accomplished by tapping into the engine's oiling system. A turbocharger is the most powerful way to add artificial aspiration to your engine, but too much boost pressure can destroy your engine. So how do we control the boost pressure? With a device known as a waste gate. The faster a turbo spins, the more boost pressure it produces. So the waste gate is designed to open at a given pressure, allowing the exhaust gases to bypass the turbine wheel, thus limiting the intake manifold pressure. The most common type of waste gate is the poppet type. Boost pressures range from about 8 PSI on production cars to more than 40 PSI on race engines. One of the things that has kept the turbo from being more popular with performance enthusiasts has been what's known as turbo lag. Turbo lag is the delay that occurs from the time you step on the accelerator to the time the turbine wheels start to spin fast enough to produce more power. Modern turbos, however, exhibit very little turbo lag because the turbine and compressor wheels are made of lightweight materials. A byproduct of compressing air is that its temperature increases and hot air in the intake means less power produced. So to cool the air before it gets to the intake manifold, some turbocharged engines have what's called an intercooler. This air-to-air -air heat exchanger works like a radiator and cools the air before it reaches the intake manifold. Turbo kits start at about $3,500, but they add anywhere from 75 to 400 horsepower, depending on the application. Ah, the magical nitrous oxide. It's one of the hottest performance products on the market. How it works is really very simple. 
Nitrous oxide, or N2O, is a gas that increases an engine's power by increasing its ability to burn more fuel. It's made up of two parts nitrogen and one part oxygen. During combustion, the intense heat breaks down the chemical bond and releases oxygen, which allows more fuel to be burned. The remaining nitrogen works as a buffer against the increased pressures that are produced. Nitrous is a liquid until it is injected into the engine as a cold gas, and as a result, it increases power by dropping air-fuel mixture temperatures as much as 75 degrees. There are two primary types of nitrous systems. The first is called a dry system. This is used on electronic fuel-injected engines. The nitrous is injected into the air intake, upstream of where the fuel is entering through the injectors. A wet system injects both nitrous and additional fuel into the air intake through the same point of entry. There are two basic types of wet systems, plate and fogger. The plate system sprays the nitrous fuel mixture from a plate installed between the carb and intake manifold. The fogger injects the nitrous fuel mixture into individual intake ports. This allows for precise control of the nitrous entering each cylinder. With either system, whenever the nitrous is activated, adding more fuel is required to keep the engine from running dangerously lean. There are many safe, well-designed nitrous kits available, starting at about $500. They are relatively easy to install with basic hand tools in about four to six hours. Typically, the bottle containing the liquid nitrous will be installed in the trunk, with lines running from the bottle to the injector plate or nozzle installed on the engine. The controls to power up the system are mounted near the driver, and most systems are activated by a switch that senses full throttle. Nitrous is designed to be used in short bursts, and the typical bottle will last about 10 times before it needs to be refilled. Depending on the application, you may have to upgrade existing components on your car like the fuel pump. All this sounds great, but how much of a power increase can you expect? Well, that depends on your wallet and your engine, but by simply bolting on a system, you can expect a power increase ranging from 50 to more than 1,000 horsepower. Air filters. If you've seen one, you've seen them all, right? <laughs> Wrong. Understanding how they work and how important they are to your car's performance can give you a noticeable horsepower gain. Here's why. Air filters are designed to clean the air as it enters your engine. This is important because over time, dirt entering through the intake can damage the internals. So what's the big deal? Put up a barrier that will block all of the dirt and let's move on. Hold on, it's not that simple. The challenge is to filter dirt while still allowing the engine to breathe as freely as possible. Efficient airflow equates to more power. Now, standard paper element filters are made from compressed fibers. The spaces between the fibers provide microscopic holes for the air to pass through. But over time, these holes become clogged and the filter progressively restricts more and more air. Also, compared to other designs, paper filters must be thicker and or the fibers more dense to meet minimum filtration standards. And that means they generally don't flow as much air less air, less power. Now choosing a popular performance air filter can improve airflow and give you more power. A popular design uses oil impregnated cotton gauze as the basis for the filter. This type of filter is more expensive but can be reused and flows as much as 50% more air than a paper filter. In addition, the layer of cotton and wire mesh on the inside of the filter straightens the airflow, reducing unwanted turbulence. There are four main considerations in selecting a performance exhaust system for your street car or truck. Back pressure, longevity, appearance, and sound. Back pressure is the pressure that builds up in the exhaust system. The amount of back pressure depends on how restrictive the exhaust system is. When it comes to making more power, we want the back pressure to be as low as possible so the engine can breathe freely. On race engines, back pressure is extremely low because the exhaust system usually consists of only a header and a short pipe. But on the street, we have to obey noise and emission standards, so street systems are much more restrictive, creating more back pressure, thus limiting an engine's horsepower potential. You'll want to consider how long the system will last. This will be based on the conditions the system will be exposed to. Look for something that will stand up to those conditions. 
Exhaust systems have to be able to withstand a two-pronged attack. On the exterior, they must be able to stand up to the punishment of things like salt, moisture, mud, and road tar. On the inside, they must survive the long-term effects of unburned hydrocarbons and moisture from condensation. To accomplish this, some performance exhaust systems are made of aluminum and or stainless steel. And speaking of stainless steel, if appearance is important, it's hard to beat it for the money. Over the last few years, the sound characteristics of the exhaust system have become increasingly important to owners. It's a subjective thing, but owners are generally very picky about what the car sounds like at idle, cruising speed, or full throttle. In general, a less restrictive performance exhaust system means 5 to 10 percent more power, but more interior noise. So do your homework and know what you're getting before you purchase a system. The typical automotive clutch uses a disc-type design. One disc is fastened to the flywheel, and the other, called a clutch disc, is connected to the transmission input shaft. The clutch disc moves back and forth, engaging and disengaging the flywheel. As the clutch disc makes contact with the flywheel, friction causes the clutch disc to spin, and quickly the two mate and spin at the same speed. A common clutch setup consists of a pilot bearing, flywheel, clutch disc, pressure plate, throwout bearing, throwout lever, and clutch housing. The pilot bearing provides support for the transmission input shaft in the end of the crankshaft. The flywheel provides a mating surface for the clutch disc. The clutch disc is lined on both sides with a heat-resistant friction material. Located between the two sides of the clutch disc is the facing spring, a thin, flat piece of metal that allows the friction surfaces to bend a little to control clutch chatter when the clutch disc first contacts the flywheel. A series of coil damping springs located toward the center of the clutch disc help control vibration. The pressure plate is bolted to the flywheel and uses either a coil or diaphragm spring setup to provide the tremendous force that's required to push the clutch disc against the flywheel. The pressure plate keeps the clutch disc, and thus the transmission, connected to the engine at all times, except when the driver pushes down on the clutch pedal in the car. When the pedal is depressed, a series of rods and levers actuate the throwout lever. The throwout lever pushes the throwout bearing against the springs on the pressure plate, releasing the force holding the clutch disc against the flywheel. This causes the clutch disc to separate or disengage from the flywheel, and no power is transferred to the transmission. Many modern clutch designs use a hydraulic system to assist the driver in disengaging the clutch from the flywheel. The transmission controls the torque and speed of the drive wheels in relation to the engine crankshaft. Without it, getting a car moving from a standstill is almost impossible. Now let's review gear ratio basics. When a small gear turns a larger one, torque increases but overall speed decreases. And when a large gear drives a small one, torque decreases but overall speed increases. And herein lies the magic of the manual transmission. Let's take a look at a basic 3-speed, but keep in mind that most 4, 5, and 6-speeds operate in the same fashion. Inside, we find four shafts. The input shaft is driven by the clutch. The output shaft connects to the input shaft, but rotates independently. Located below are a counter shaft and a reverse idler shaft. Mounted on these shafts are a number of gears, along with synchronizers. A set of shift forks fit into the grooves in the synchronizer sleeve. The forks are attached to either a shift rail or linkage rods, which are attached to the gear shift lever. On our three-speed transmission, the output shaft achieves a gear ratio of about three to one for first gear and reverse, about two to one for second gear, and one to one for third gear. Here's how it's done. In neutral, power from the input shaft is transferred by way of the third gear down to the counter gear shaft, which rotates all of the other gears on the output shaft. But because none of them are locked to the output shaft, they spin freely and no power is transferred. When you select first gear, 
the shift fork slides the first reverse synchronizer over to lock first gear to the output shaft, and power is transferred. When second gear is selected, the second third synchronizer moves over and locks second gear to the output shaft. For third gear, the second third synchronizer moves over and locks the input shaft directly to the output shaft to achieve the final gear ratio of one to one. Oh, and for reverse, the first reverse synchronizer moves over and engages the reverse gear. The change in output shaft rotation is achieved by the fact that the reverse idler gear drives reverse gear and not the counter shaft directly. In the old days, manual transmissions were not fully synchronized and changing gears, especially downshifting into first, produced loud grinding noises as the gears tried to mesh. The synchronizers allow for smooth shifting. When the synchronizer moves into an output gear, the synchronizer cone contacts the gear first and the cone and gear begin turning at the same speed, allowing the teeth on the gears to mesh cleanly. Here are the secrets of how the ubiquitous American automatic transmission works. Drum roll, please. The automatic transmission uses three types of power transfer, friction, fluid, and gear, to accomplish the same thing as a manual transmission that's shifted by a human. It is by far the most complicated mechanical device ever devised for the automobile. It all starts up front with an unsung hero, the torque converter. This large and heavy donut-shaped device transfers torque by way of transmission fluid from the engine to the transmission input shaft. Inside are an impeller, turbine, and stator. The impeller is turned by the engine and generates a fluid flow. The fluid moves across the converter where it rotates the turbine on the other side. This transfers torque between the impeller and turbine by way of the transmission fluid. In between is the stator. It redirects fluid circulation, which increases torque and overall efficiency. The converter also serves as a torque multiplier. Because of its design, engine torque is as much as doubled by the time it reaches the transmission input shaft. It has the same effect on torque as does turning a larger gear with a smaller one. Torque multiplication occurs when the impeller is rotating faster than the turbine. Maximum torque multiplication is achieved at stall speed, when the impeller is turning at its fastest point before the turbine begins to rotate. The automatic transmission shifts gears with an engineering marvel that is as simple as it is brilliant, the planetary gear set. This compact gear set consists of a sun gear, ring gear, and two or more planet gears that all rotate in relationship to each other to provide the final gear ratios and direction to the drive shaft. The planetary gear set gets its name from the way the planets move around the sun. A housing or bracket called a planet gear carrier holds the planet gears in their position around the sun gear. Now here are the basics of how the planetary gear set operates. To achieve a gear reduction, say for first gear, the sun gear is locked in position and the ring gear is driven by the input shaft. This causes the planetary gears to rotate around the stationary sun gear and drive the output shaft. Because of the difference in gear size, the planetary gear set rotates slower but with greater torque. The same thing can be accomplished by locking the ring gear and driving the sun gear. When overdrive ratios are needed, the ring gear is locked and the planet carrier is driven by the input shaft. This rotates the sun gear and the output shaft faster but with less torque than the planet carrier. Neutral, or park, is achieved by allowing all the gears to spin freely so no power is transferred to the output shaft. An automatic transmission will also operate in direct drive when any two of the gear types are locked. This causes the input and output shafts to rotate at the same speed. Two other important areas of the automatic are the clutches and bands and the hydraulic system. We talked earlier about the planetary gear sets and how they provide the final gear ratio for the drive shaft. 
The ballet of locking and rotating gears in a planetary gear set is controlled by a series of clutches and bands. A clutch assembly typically includes a series of clutch discs, springs, and pistons. The clutch is used to either drive or lock the gear set members in the planetary gear set. The bands are used to stop the rotation of a rotating part or assembly. Here again, good old-fashioned friction is put to good use. The hydraulic system includes the torque converter and the sensing, control and lubrication areas of the automatic transmission. Included in this system are the pump, pressure regulator valve, governor valve, manual valve, vacuum modulator valve, various shift valves, servos and valve body. The sensing part of this system decides when the transmission will shift gears by measuring vehicle speed and engine vacuum data. The various valves and pistons actuate the clutches and bands. Late model automatics use electronic transmission control of shift points, downshift points, torque converter lockup and other general operation. Keep in mind, transmission fluid contains additives that make the fluid compatible with a specific type of automatic transmission. This explains why Ford guys have to buy one type of fluid and GM guys another. The differential is a simple but extremely important part of any car. It transfers torque from the drive shaft to the drive wheels through a 90 degree angle, sends an equal amount of torque to each drive wheel and allows each drive wheel to spin at different speeds. It also provides the final gear reduction. And as you remember, a gear ratio of 3 to 1 means the pinion gear is rotating three times for every rotation of the ring gear. You can find the gear ratio by counting the number of teeth on each gear. In this case, the pinion gear has 10 teeth and the ring gear 30. Here's how the differential can accomplish all of this. The drive shaft bolts to the pinion gear at the front of the differential housing. The pinion gear turns a larger ring gear. The ingenious part of the differential is located in the differential case and allows each drive wheel to rotate at a different speed. This is important because often the wheels are not rotating at the same speed. For instance, when the car turns, the outside wheel turns faster than the inside wheel. Now it gets a little tricky here, so stay with me. The differential case is connected to the ring gear and thus rotates with it. Inside are four spider gears, two axle gears that are mounted on the ends of each axle, and two pinion gears that are mounted on a pinion shaft, which in turn is mounted to the sides of the differential case. Still with me? When the ring gear and differential case rotate, the pinion gears transfer torque equally from the rotating differential case to the two axle gears, and the axles rotate the wheels. Now when one wheel is turning slower, like during a turn, the pinion gears rotate around the pinion shaft, allowing the opposite wheel to rotate faster. For instance, in a straight line, each drive wheel may be turning at 500 RPM. If the one wheel slows to 300 RPM, then the opposite wheel speed will increase to 700 RPM. Earlier, we talked about the basic design of the differential. The downside of this design is that if one wheel spins freely, say on ice, the other wheel will not spin at all because the amount of torque being transferred to that wheel is too low. Limited slip differentials solve this problem by supplying torque to both of the wheels, even when one begins to slip. Limited slip differentials are known by several different names, including Posit Traction and Sure Grip. The most common type of limited slip design is called the Clutch Pack. It uses a set of friction discs and steel plates. The steel discs have tabs that keep them locked to the differential housing while the friction discs spin with the axle gears. A large spring in the center forces the steel plates and the friction discs together, causing torque to be transferred to each wheel. This setup improves traction when driving in snow, ice or mud, but still allows each axle to rotate at different speeds when the car is turning a corner. The cone clutch uses cone-shaped axle gears to drive the axles. 
friction produced by the cone gear as it rubs against the ends of the differential case allows torque to be transferred to each wheel. A torsion differential is called a locking differential and has a set of worm gears that transfer power to both drive wheels. The ratchet type differential, known as a Detroit locker, uses matching sets of teeth that engage and disengage to get torque transferred to each drive wheel. Let's review a few of the basics of how modern brake systems operate. Production vehicle brakes use a hydraulic system to actuate either disc or drum brakes. The job of the brakes is to slow or stop a vehicle by using friction to transform kinetic energy, motion, into thermal energy, heat. With disc brakes, this is accomplished with calipers and pads that apply a strong clamping force against the brake rotor. With drum brakes, the friction is applied by the brake shoes as they squeeze outward against the inner walls of the brake drum. Because weight is transferred to the front of the car during braking, the front tires are pressed harder against the road and the back tires begin to lift off the road. So during braking, the front tires have a better grip while the rear tires lose some of theirs. That's why the front brakes do about 70% of the work. Now the key to any hydraulic system is a physics principle. When confined, liquids will not compress. So when you step on the brake pedal, the force you're applying is transferred through the brake fluid to the brakes at each wheel. And because of the design of the system and power assists, the force you apply with your foot is multiplied many times over, resulting in pressures ranging from about 500 to more than 1,000 pounds per square inch, depending on the vehicle. Now air, on the other hand, will compress, and this is why we must bleed our brakes when it gets into the brake fluid. For safety and performance reasons, modern cars have dual master cylinders. The systems are split one of two ways, either longitudinally, with one master cylinder operating the front brakes and the other the rear, or diagonally, with each master cylinder operating a brake at the opposite corner. Once the hydraulic pressure reaches each wheel, it forces a piston outward, which in turn forces the brake pad against the rotor. Most production cars use a single piston on one side of a floating caliper that applies pressure on both sides of the rotor. Higher performing brake calipers are stationary and use one or more pistons located on each side. Performance brake systems and components are designed to operate more efficiently and consistently with the ability to withstand the high heat of competition. High performance braking is about finding the threshold between stopping power, heat management, and vehicle control. There are three main reasons to upgrade your stock calipers. Clamping force, deflection, and pad performance. Aftermarket calipers have superior clamping force, which translates into shorter stopping distances. Most stock calipers are a single piston design with a floating mount. When you brake hard, stock calipers can twist in their mounts and lose alignment with the rotor. This deflection can cause uneven pad wear and less effective braking. Plus, pressure is only applied to the middle of one pad on one side. Performance calipers will have multiple pistons with a fixed or rigid mount design. There's less deflection in the mounting and pressure is applied evenly to the entire length of the pads, resulting in better wear and better stopping power. Most stock rotors are not designed for serious high performance driving. Sometimes the performance rotors will be larger for more leverage to stop the wheels and more surface area for pad contact and cooling. The finned area between the two sides of a vented rotor provides superior cooling by absorbing and dissipating more heat. Some rotors are cross-drilled or slotted to reduce weight and provide additional venting between the pad and rotor face to keep the pad faces clean. Sometimes a performance rotor will be lighter to reduce overall weight. At the drag strip, the brakes are used for short bursts. This is a case of lighter is faster. In the end, though, do your homework before you select performance brakes for your vehicle. Great-looking wheels have been compared to the big, beautiful eyes on a supermodel. They draw your attention and reflect the soul of the body. 
Looking back, steel wheels were the norm until the 50s when mag wheels were introduced. Mag is short for magnesium, the aircraft-derived alloy used in many early European and American sports car wheels. Magnesium is lighter than steel, but heavier than aluminum. Today, automotive manufacturers still use steel wheels on their low-budget vehicles. However, steel is relatively heavy and has a tendency to flex under stress. Magnesium wheels have been replaced by aluminum alloy wheels in the aftermarket and on upgraded OEM vehicles. The biggest advantage of aluminum wheels is their lighter weight. Aluminum alloy wheels are manufactured in two ways, cast and forged. The conventional gravity casting process involves pouring the metal into a mold where it hardens. Another more sophisticated technique is called counter-pressure casting and uses vacuum to draw the alloy into the mold, creating a stronger cast wheel. Forging is the most advanced method of manufacturing wheels. In this process, a billet, or raw block of aluminum, is softened by heating it slightly. Then a giant press with up to 15 million pounds of pressure compresses the billet into the shape of the wheel. Another process called rolled forging is often used to form the rim pieces of the wheel. There are three basic construction types for wheels. One piece, two piece, and three piece. The two piece wheel has a center section and an outer rim section or other variation. The three piece wheel has a center section and inner and outer rim section. The separate pieces are either welded or bolted together. Because of the process and alloy used, gravity cast wheels have a tendency to be porous, which makes them brittle and prone to breaking under severe driving conditions. That's because small air pockets can form in the wheel during the casting process. Forged wheels are more expensive, but they're up to 25% lighter and three times stronger than the typical cast wheel. Another major difference between cast and forged wheels is the type of aluminum alloy used. Cast wheels are typically made from A356 aluminum, while forged wheels use 6061 aluminum alloy, which is much stronger. There are several basic considerations when fitting wheels to your car. First and most important, the wheel must fit properly. The wheel should easily clear disc brakes and calipers and not hit the inner fender or suspension components when the wheel is turned or when the suspension compresses. The wheel diameter and width determine what size tire can be mounted. You can generally purchase rims and diameters ranging from 14 to 22 inches. A popular way to maximize the look and performance of your wheels and tires is called plus sizing. Plus sizing involves selecting a larger wheel in combination with a lower profile tire. This allows you to keep the overall diameter of the tire unchanged while putting more visual emphasis on the wheel. Because the tire sidewall is shorter and stiffer, the car will steer quicker and have more lateral stability. The bolt pattern on wheels will range from four to eight lugs, with a five lug design being the most common. The hub diameter, or center bore, is the hole at the center of the wheel. If the hub diameter matches the hub exactly, the wheel is called hub-centric, meaning the weight of the vehicle is being supported at this point. A lug-centric wheel has a larger hub diameter than the actual hub, so the clamping force of the lug nuts is actually supporting the weight of the vehicle. Rear spacing is the distance from the backside of the wheel mounting pad to the outside of the rim flange. Wheel offset is the distance from the imaginary center line of the wheel rim shell to the mounting surface of the wheel. A negative offset has the mounting pad located on the inner side of the center line. A positive offset has the mounting pad located on the outer side of the wheel center line. This is the most popular design for today's vehicles. We recommend that you discuss your needs with the professionals at your local tire or wheel store.
make an informed buying decision, you must understand a few basics about tires. First of all, there are three construction types, bias, belted bias, and radial. Bias ply tires are constructed with two or more cord plies of woven fabric, usually made of polyester. The plies cross each other at right angles and form the foundation for the tread layers. The first bias belted tires appeared in 1965 and improved upon the bias construction by adding fiberglass belts. Then in the mid-70s, radial tires began to dominate the U.S. market. They are constructed with two or more steel belts located between the ply layers and the tread. Radials provide better handling, heat management, ride, and mileage. Now the tire industry uses a set of tire measuring standards that look like a geometry pop quiz, but here are several measurements to keep in mind. The nominal rim diameter is the widest point between the bead seats and is expressed in either inches or millimeters. Section height is the distance between the tire's bead seat and the outer edge of the tread. Section width is the distance from sidewall to sidewall. The section height and width are used to calculate the tire's aspect ratio. The lower the aspect ratio, the lower the profile of the tire. For the largest contact patch, you'll want tires with a low aspect ratio and wider wheels. Understanding tire sizing is also important. There are several different sizing systems being used today and it can be a little confusing. The original tire sizing system is called numeric sizing and was used until the late 60s. It listed the tire's section width and rim diameter. In 1968, the alphanumeric sizing system was introduced. This load-based system begins with a letter, A through N, that represents the tire's load-carrying capacity in relationship to its aspect ratio. It also gives the type of construction, aspect ratio, and rim diameter. The metric sizing system came to the U.S. from Europe. It's basically a conversion of the alphanumeric system with section widths expressed in millimeters instead of inches. The P-metric or passenger metric sizing system was developed from the metric system for smaller tires used on compact cars. There are several other sizing systems including those developed for light trucks that include an LT somewhere in the sizing code. Most passenger car tires use the P-metric system, while most drag tires are still referred to by enthusiasts using the older systems. With performance street tires, there are a couple of other important things to know. In the U.S., all performance tires must be speed rated. They are tested in the laboratory to meet certain minimum government standards for reaching and sustaining a specific speed. The certified speed rating symbols usually range from the letter S, 112 miles per hour, to the letter Y, above 186 miles per hour. Typically, this letter symbol appears at the end of the sizing code on the tire. Tires with speed ratings of 149 miles per hour or higher may have a ZR in the size designation. It's also important to understand tread compounds and designs. Modern tires are made up of 15 or more different compounds that work together to give the tire its performance characteristics. We don't have time to go into the makeup of these compounds, but generally, softer tread compounds will provide better traction and grip. Harder compounds, better tread life. A tire's tread design affects everything from its ability to grip the road, in both wet and dry conditions, to its heat resistance. There are three basic tread design types, symmetrical, asymmetrical, and unidirectional. A symmetrical design has a consistent mirror image pattern across the tread. Asymmetrical designs have a pattern that changes across the face of the tire. Typically, it has larger tread blocks on the outer edge for increased cornering ability because larger tread blocks tend to move or squirm less under cornering forces. The unidirectional tread rolls in only one direction and is designed to reduce rolling resistance and provide shorter stopping distances. If you ride much, it's happened to you. You slam on the brakes to avoid a hazard and go into a skid. It's one of the scariest and most dangerous aspects of riding. Let's take a look at what's happening and see if there's a way to prevent it. The brake system, easily the most important safety feature on any motorcycle, is basically an energy conversion device, changing kinetic energy, your bike's momentum, into thermal energy, heat. Today, when you apply the brakes, you're exerting thousands of pounds of pressure on each wheel up to 10 times greater than the force that put the bike in motion. And that's good, right? Well, yes, except for one thing, wheel lock. 
That's what happens in those panic situations when you slam on the brakes. The problem is simple. Modern brakes have enough stopping force to lock the wheels. That is, to make the wheels stop rotating before the bike's momentum has been overcome. When that happens, you and the bike go into a skid, generally in a straight line in the direction the bike was going, and that's not good. Locking the brakes can have disastrous results in automobiles as well as motorcycles. In fact, for most of us, locking up that front wheel is one of our worst phobias. So how can you stop a bike in an emergency situation without losing control? The answer is ABS, the anti-lock brake system. ABS was pioneered for bikes by BMW in the late 1980s. To understand ABS, first let's get familiar with how disc brakes operate. The disc brake consists of a strong flat metal disc securely bolted to the wheel and one or more sets of calipers containing brake pads. The pads are made of a heat resistant material designed to create friction. When the brakes are applied, hydraulic pressure forces the calipers to pinch together like a vise, forcing the brake pads onto the disc and creating the friction that slows and stops the wheel. But these brakes can still lock up and send your bike into a skid. Enter ABS. Using electronic wheel speed sensors and computer data processing, ABS determines if a wheel is decelerating too fast during braking. If a wheel locks up, the sensor immediately relays the information to the electronic control unit. And that's when the anti-lock brake system truly does what no rider can, accurately limit the amount of pressure to the wheel in danger of skidding, while still applying enough pressure to safely stop the bike. So, how does the anti-lock brake system manage to limit the amount of braking force on a wheel but still manage to stop your bike safely? The answer, computer-controlled valves that regulate the pressure delivered to each brake caliper. The moment the electronic control unit recognizes that a wheel is starting to lock up, the pressure modulator goes into action and instantly lowers the hydraulic pressure in the brake cylinder. As soon as the rotation sensors sense that the wheel is rotating again, the pressure modulator commands the brake cylinder to once again apply full braking force. This pulsating braking action continues to repeat up to seven times per second, as long as the rider continues to apply full braking pressure and as long as the speed of the bike stays above two and a half miles per hour. The results? See for yourself in this BMW demonstration on asphalt treated with water, detergent and straw. No way the bike without ABS can stop in this mess. But at 35 miles per hour, 45 miles per hour, even 55 miles per hour with a passenger, the ABS equipped bike just can't lock up and stops at the same spot every time in perfect control. So what if all this electronic stuff fries in the middle of a ride? Not really a problem. You see, new anti-lock systems supplement the conventional brakes. And even if the ABS fails, the conventional brakes will continue to work normally. But the BMW system, for instance, checks itself every time the bike is started and every time the brakes are applied. If there's a problem, warning lights go on and the system turns itself off, leaving normal braking unaffected. Plus, the electronic control unit actually contains two control circuits that monitor and can replace one another. On wet or slippery pavement and in dangerous stopping conditions, ABS can give you the control to stay on top of your bike. Even in dry, near-perfect stopping conditions, ABS can give you shorter stopping distances and better control. Does that mean that having ABS means you can take greater risks when riding? No! Does ABS save lives? I absolutely know BMW is saving lives. More manufacturers are offering ABS on more kinds of bikes every year. Something to think about when choosing your next ride. Over the years, five basic types of paint have been used on automobiles. In the 20s, synthetic enamel was the paint of choice. Then, nitrocellulose lacquer came along. In the 50s and 60s, acrylic lacquer and acrylic enamel were introduced and acrylic urethane was developed in the 70s. Each type of paint can be classified by the method of drying. Lacquers dry by solvent evaporation, enamels by oxidation, and urethanes by chemical reaction. Today, acrylic urethane is the paint of choice for most applications, although acrylic lacquer is occasionally used on restorations and custom paint jobs. Acrylic lacquer is fast drying and has a lower build requiring more coats. 
Its major weakness is that it's not very solvent and weather resistant. Acrylic urethane is actually a modified version of acrylic enamel. Urethanes contain hydroxyl groups that react with a catalyst, forming a tough, flexible, high gloss and very low maintenance finish, hence their popularity. Automotive paints have three major components. Pigment provides the color of the paint. Resin is the film forming part of the paint that binds the pigment together. Today, plastic is used as a resin and provides the backbone of the paint while providing flexibility and durability. Acrylics are the most widely used, hence the names acrylic enamel, acrylic lacquer, and acrylic urethane. Solvent is used to turn the pigment and resin into a sprayable liquid. Additives are also added to the mix that help improve weathering, flow and leveling, pigment stability, and drying and curing. Paints are usually available in two forms, single stage and base coat. Single stage, also known as direct gloss, provides the color as well as the gloss and finished texture in one application. Because the color is close to the surface, it's not protected from UV rays from the sun and other environmental contaminants. The base coat finish applies the color and metallic in the first application. The gloss and environmental protection are handled in a separate application called a clear coat. This type of finish is more expensive, but it does an excellent job of protecting the color layers. Today, most automotive paint jobs use the base coat finish. There are a wide variety of custom style paint finishes. Many years ago, paint developers figured out they could add small pieces of aluminum and other metals to the pigment and resin to create deep, rich looking metal flake finishes. The metal particles can be very small or larger to produce a strong glitter effect. Pearl finishes use particles of mica coated in a light refracting titanium dioxide coating. In its mother of pearl form, the semi-transparent mid-coat is applied over a white base coat to provide that deep iridescent look. Today, auto manufacturers use this type of metallic paint technique to create a variety of colors. The classic candy finish uses a colored dye suspended in a clear film that's applied over the base coat color before the clear coat is applied. The result is an extremely deep, rich look. Color shifting paints are a more recent development. There are several brands, but most people know them by the trade name Chameleon. They're a modified version of Pearl that have chemical compounds added that allow the paint to reflect light differently from different angles. The result is that dramatic hologram effect. Most of us have purchased a fuel additive, but how do they work and when should we use them? Good questions. Let's learn the basics. The most common type of fuel additive is a cleaner. They are sold as different types, carb cleaners, fuel injector cleaners, or fuel system cleaners, but most are variations of about three or four detergent-based formulas. They're designed to be added to a full tank of gas and gradually remove carbon and varnish deposits as you drive. The actual formulas can be a bit complicated and quality does vary, but they generally include a combination of detergents, demulsifiers, carrier fluids, rust and corrosion inhibitors, and lubricants for injectors and fuel pumps. The detergents remove deposits and the carrier fluids transport them to be burned during combustion. As a rule, deposits are larger and harder to remove the closer they are to the combustion chamber. A product that raises the octane level of your fuel should be used in high performance engines or older engines when regular pump gas octane levels are not high enough. Most pump gases have octane numbers from 87 to 93, but your high performance engine may run better on, say, 96 octane. Here's why. An octane number is a measure of a fuel's resistance to pinging, also called knocking, which occurs when a fuel does not burn consistently across the combustion chamber. Instead, while the flame is spreading across the chamber, other areas of the fuel begin burning spontaneously, causing a violent collision of the flame fronts. That's what causes the pinging noise you hear. Raising the octane number of your fuel makes the fuel burn consistently across the chamber. Severe damage can occur if an engine pings or knocks for long periods of time.
Up until the mid-70s, tetraethyl lead was added to gas at the refinery to raise the octane of pump gas and to provide a protective barrier for valve seats. It was phased out because it was found to be a health hazard. Today's valve seats are hardened and don't require this type of protection, but older valve seats are soft and will micro-weld. A slow recession of the valve seat under high temperature conditions without the protective barrier that lead or a lead substitute provides. When it comes to oil additives marketed to give your car extra protection against wear, there is some controversy. Many people, including the manufacturers, are confident in their effectiveness. Some critics refer to them as snake oils because they believe they really don't perform the way they are marketed or are unnecessary. Now, we're not going to take sides, and some products undoubtedly work better than others, so our only word of advice is do some research on a product before you buy it. The majority of oil additives are primarily designed to give your oil better anti-wear protection. But keep in mind, all brands of oil already have an additive package in them. But the additive products available off the shelf claim to have more and or different additives that provide increased protection. The chemistry involved here is fairly advanced, but anti-wear oil additives basically work by providing a better coating or plating on engine parts. This is generally accomplished by starting with a heavyweight oil and then adding an additive package that usually has either PTFE, commonly known by the trademark name Teflon, or zinc dialkyl diphosphate as the key ingredient. Other types of oil additives are designed to strip away sludge and carbon deposits from your engine. These usually contain detergents and solvents and are added to high mileage engines to clean internal components. There are also additives designed for the most neglected part of a car, the cooling system. These products generally provide better cooling by increasing heat transfer rates, prevent rust and corrosion of the cooling system, and provide lubrication for water pumps. Today's automotive gauges fall into two main categories, analog and digital. Here are the differences. Analog gauges have the traditional mechanical needle that moves along the gauge face, much like the movement of a clock. There are two types of analog gauges, electric and mechanical. For example, an oil pressure gauge can be either type. If it's electric, a sending unit mounted to the engine will send an electric current to the gauge face. As the oil pressure changes, the level of current will change and so will the reading on the gauge. A mechanical oil pressure gauge uses a tube that brings oil to the gauge where it's physically measured and then displayed on the gauge face. Over the years, automotive gauges have moved away from mechanical gauges because electric gauges are easier to install and safer. Digital gauges use the same type of electric sending units as their electric analog counterparts, but the way the information is displayed is different. If we go back to our oil pressure gauge example, the digital version will display the signal from the sending unit in an electronic numeric format, such as 32, for 32 pounds of engine oil pressure. Both analog and digital gauges are very accurate if they're quality units, so for most people, picking one over the other is basically an aesthetic decision. However, racers have always preferred analog gauges because they are easier to read and comprehend at a quick glance. Digital gauges, on the other hand, give the driver a more easily understood, less ambiguous reading. A comparison of analog and digital versions of our oil pressure gauge shows the difference. The analog gauge must have the driver judge whether the needle is pointing to the 31, 32, or 33 mark, while the digital version simply reads 32. Installing electric analog gauges and digital gauges is essentially the same when it comes to individual gauges. Going back to our oil pressure gauge example, both the analog and digital gauges have a sending unit that must be mounted to the engine and the gauge mounted in the dash. Power, ground and sending input wires are then run to the gauge. Additionally, the analog gauge typically has a wire to provide power to light the gauge at night and the digital gauge will have a wire that allows the numeric display to dim at night. One of the advantages of electric gauges is they can be mounted almost anywhere. Mechanical gauges require a different setup. 
Again, looking at our oil pressure gauge example, the mechanical type will require an oil line to be run from the engine to the back of the gauge. The only electric wire that may be required provides the power to illuminate the gauge at night. However, mechanical gauges pose safety issues. For example, a nick or break in the oil line feeding the gauge may result in the driver being sprayed with hot oil. Because of the tubing or cables that must be run to a mechanical gauge, the positioning options in the car's interior are limited. You can purchase individual gauges or gauge pods or clusters that incorporate the most popular and useful gauges in one unit. The choices for both analog and digital gauges continue to grow as manufacturers make them easier to install and more aesthetically pleasing. To drive a race car fast is to drive it on the edge. If you're not on the edge, you're either not driving hard enough or you're out of control. So the best race car drivers know where the edge is and they stay on it lap after lap. A car, no matter how powerful, is only as fast as its ability to grip the road surface. The contact patch, or the area where the tire contacts the road, is generally only a few square inches, and the weight distribution is fairly equal at rest. But a car in motion is subject to continuous dynamic changes. These changes increase and decrease the size and gripping ability of the contact patches based on weight transfer. For instance, when you accelerate, weight is transferred to the rear of the car, causing the contact patches in the rear to grow and the patches in the front to become smaller. At the same time, the amount of pressure pushing down on the tires in the rear increases and the pressure on the front decreases. This dramatically increases the gripping power of the rear tires while decreasing the gripping power of the front tires. The opposite is true when you step on the brakes. Weight is transferred forward and the front tires increase their grip while the rear tires lose some of theirs. Turning the car transfers weight from side to side. Turning and accelerating or turning and braking transfers a substantial amount of the weight and thus the gripping power to a specific tire. Good performance drivers are able to constantly transfer weight to the tires that need the most grip at that moment in time. For example, to enter a left-hand corner with the most possible speed, the right front tire will need to have the most grip, so as much weight as possible will be transferred to that tire as the car begins to turn in. To achieve this, the race car driver will want to be turning and aggressively braking at the same time. The average driver does these two things separately, braking and then turning in. This transfers weight to the front of the car first and then to the right side of the car during the turn, which means there will be less grip on the right front and the car will not be able to make the corner as fast. Although it's hard to see or feel if you're not in the car, a good driver is constantly using the throttle, brake and steering in concert with each other to transfer weight from one wheel to another. The key to carrying a lot of speed through a corner is finding the proper line. The line is the path a car travels as it approaches, negotiates and then exits the corner. The right line is generally the one that allows the car to travel the widest arc and thus with the most speed. This cornering line will have three key points. The first, called the turn-in point, is where the driver begins to turn the car into the corner. The second, called the apex, is the point where the car passes closest to the inside part of the track. And the third, called the exit point, is where the car completes the turn. As you've seen, drivers will use every inch of the racetrack and then saw the rumble strips, to create a line that will allow the car to carry the most speed. Hitting the turn-in point and apex point correctly is critical. If you turn too early, you'll miss the proper apex point and you'll either have to slow down or run off the racetrack. If you turn in too late, you'll have to brake too much to make the corner and miss both the apex and exit points. The same type of problems occur when the turn-in point is correct and the apex point is missed. When it comes to braking, there are two main considerations. The braking point and trail braking. When you approach the corner, you want to stay in the throttle for as long as possible before you brake hard for the corner. 
Race car drivers pick a point along the side of the track as their braking point. For the fastest drivers, it's also known as the point of no return. Because if they miss their braking point, they'll carry too much speed into the corner and the car will run off the track. Most racetracks have distance markers located alongside the track approaching the corner for the drivers to use as reference points. It's at this braking point that the driver quickly lifts off the accelerator and applies full brake. This is also where trail braking comes into play. Trail braking is continuing to brake once the car starts to turn into the corner. Trail braking transfers weight to the front of the car, especially to the outside tire, increasing the grip of the front tires and allowing the car to carry the maximum speed. Once the car gets turned in, the driver will let off the brake and get back on the gas. This transfers weight to the rear of the car and plants the rear end as the car accelerates out of the corner. Horsepower and torque. Two terms that we often use in our automotive jargon. But what do the terms really mean? And what's the difference between horsepower and torque? Hey, don't worry, you don't have to phone a friend. Allow me to save you a dime. Horsepower is a measure of an engine's power or ability to perform work. Years ago, it was the approximate strength of one horse. So in theory, a 400 horsepower engine could do the work of 400 horses. Torque is a twisting or turning force. When you twist the top off your favorite beverage, you're applying torque. Now in simplest terms, an engine creates torque or performs work, and we can measure how much work is being performed by calculating its horsepower. In other words, we need to know force in pounds and velocity in feet per second to measure horsepower. The formula is simple and is based on the principle that one horsepower equals 550 pounds being lifted one foot in one second. So horsepower equals distance times weight over 33,000, or work foot-pounds of torque over 33,000. Now you'll hear horsepower expressed in different ways. For example, brake horsepower measures the work output at the crankshaft and not at the drive wheels. The Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE, has set up standards for measuring horsepower that include gross and net ratings. Gross horsepower is the peak power an engine develops without some accessories in operation. Net horsepower is measured with all the accessories in use. This is important to understand because before 1972, manufacturers used the higher ratings, gross horsepower, when they advertised their cars. Today, most manufacturers use the lower, net ratings. Based on what we talked about earlier, horsepower equals torque times RPM over 5,252. Typically, torque and RPM are measured using a dynamometer, or dyno. Once these two variables are known, the engine's horsepower can be calculated. There are two basic types of dynos. The chassis dyno, that measures torque at the drive wheels, and an engine dyno, that measures torque at the engine's crankshaft. The chassis dyno uses inertia to measure power. A vehicle is positioned so that the drive wheels are aligned with two massive steel drums. As the engine is run up to full throttle, the drive wheels turn the steel drums. Their massive weight and a drum braking system apply a load or resistance to the engine. A computer measures the rate at which the drums are rotating to calculate torque. The computer then calculates horsepower and plots both horsepower and torque along the RPM range. The typical engine dyno works in the same fashion. The main difference is that the engine is mounted on a stand and a dyno load cell is bolted directly to the flywheel. This engine dyno uses pressurized water to load the engine. In the end, however, the same basic formula is used to calculate torque and horsepower. Engine dynos are cumbersome, but they can be used to test other engine characteristics, like fuel flow rates. They are also used for emissions testing. One other thing to keep in mind, internal combustion engines are sensitive to atmospheric conditions. So to compare torque or horsepower measurements taken at different times or places, it is necessary to use a correction factor to compensate for differing atmospheric conditions. Hand tools have been with us since the first rock was used as a hammer by our early ancestors. 
Today, we rely on our hand tools to help us repair and modify our performance vehicles. Now, all hand tools are not created equal, and you get what you pay for. Ask any professional mechanic and he'll tell you, quality pays for itself over and over. The average guy should only have to purchase a set of quality tools once, because they're designed to outlive their owner. So what should you look for in a quality professional hand tool? Look for tools made from the highest quality steel, that are designed to exacting tolerances, that are forged and not cast, and that have been through a high quality heat treating and chrome plating process. The bottom line? You'll get better quality, better operation, fewer mistakes, and a warranty. Though it varies from company to company, quality hand tools generally follow a few time-tested manufacturing techniques. It all starts with the raw steel that is inspected for flaws and imperfections. The best tools are made from the finest stock available because even a small crack can cause the tool to fail. The raw steel is then cut into the proper lengths by a shearing machine and heated to about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The red-hot steel is then raw forged by a four-cavity die procedure. Here, the steel is pounded into a series of shapes by each die. The four stages are roller, blocker, finisher, and trim. This process is done very quickly, one piece at a time. Next, the finishing takes place. For a typical combination wrench, this is a 24-step process. The first and most visual process involves punching out the working ends of the wrench. Again, the steel is heated to about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and then the shape is punched out. The wrench is then machine polished to remove the rough spots on the edges and flats created by the forging process. The final polishing step is done by hand, because a machine cannot give the tool the look and feel that the finest quality tools have. Only an operator with years of experience can accomplish this, one tool at a time. Each wrench is then marked with the company name, part number, and size, and then run through the bending machine where the correct angle is applied. Next, the wrench is heat treated to anneal the steel for hardness. The furnace heats the wrench to about 1550 degrees Fahrenheit, and endothermic gas is injected to equalize the internal atmosphere of the furnace to match the internal composition of the steel. The wrench is then quenched in water, and when cool, it will have a 5856 Rockwell hardness, which is still very brittle. To temper the steel to the desired hardness, the wrench must be placed into an electric oven for about two hours. A wheel abrader then sandblasts it to remove scale created during the heat treating process. The final polishing process is performed in a vibrator. Here, ceramic stones and chemicals are used to polish and clean the tool. Chrome plating protects the wrench for long life and adds a beautiful skin to a very rugged tool. The process begins with nickel plating. The wrench is put into a nickel solution where electrolysis adheres the nickel to the steel. Then, the wrench is rinsed twice before being dropped in the chrome plating solution. In a chemical process that takes about five minutes, the chrome bonds to the nickel and the chrome plating is complete. The wrench is then inspected for any flaws in cosmetics or dimensions. Other hand tools, like sockets and ratchets, follow a similar manufacturing process. One of the interesting things about ratchets is that they are still hand-assembled by some of the world's best tool companies. Here, skilled assemblers add the inner workings to the ratchet and make sure it works properly and smoothly. They even give it the I dropped it on the concrete floor test to ensure that it will outlast its owner. Once you own a set of quality hand tools, it's important that you use and care for them properly. Using a tool incorrectly, as most of us know, can damage the fastener, the tool, and most painful of all, our knuckles. As it turns out, a lot of us use our tools incorrectly, so let's review a few basics. Sockets have either 6 or 12 points and are made to fit either 6 or 12 point fasteners. Six-point sockets are generally stronger and more torque accurate because they grip the fastener better. Twelve-point sockets are used on twelve-point fasteners, but they are useful when working on six-point fasteners in tight spaces since they require less movement of the socket. However, you should avoid applying high torque to a six-point fastener with a twelve-point socket. 
Standard length sockets are used for normal applications and in small spaces. Long length sockets are used for recessed fasteners and for fasteners on studs. Standard sockets are for hand use only. This means for use on non-impact applications, such as with ratchets or breaker bars. Impact sockets are made for use on pneumatic tools, such as impact wrenches, where the torque forces will be much greater. These sockets are generally thicker and made using different manufacturing processes to achieve greater strength. When it comes to wrenches, use the combination wrench correctly. The box end is used for breaking the fastener free and is designed to provide maximum grip. Use the open end of the wrench to remove the fastener quickly once it's been broken loose. With wrenches or sockets, make sure to position them for both effectiveness and safety. And remember to avoid the temptation to over-tighten the fasteners. Fasteners, especially those of high quality, are designed to be torqued to a given point expressed in foot-pounds. When you torque a bolt, it actually stretches, and that's what's providing the clamping power. If the bolt is not torqued enough, it will work itself loose over time. And if too much torque is applied, the bolt will break. So use a torque wrench and follow your torque specs and sequences. Bolts can also fail because of fatigue or the long-term cumulative effect of being tightened over and over. The top engine builders will also tell you if you can't screw a nut and bolt together by hand first, they should not be used on your engine. Today's car audio systems are a complicated combination of components designed to reproduce sounds with the greatest of quality. The typical car audio system consists of an antenna, receiver, CD player, amplifier, speakers, and wiring. The car audio receiver is designed to receive both AM and FM radio station signals. AM stands for amplitude modulation and has frequencies that range from 530 to 1710 kilohertz. FM stands for frequency modulation and has a much higher frequency range of 88 to 108 megahertz. High-powered audio systems have an amplifier. As the name suggests, it's used to boost the signal from the receiver and or CD player to the speakers. Speakers are transducers that use a coil of wire, a permanent magnet, and diaphragm to convert the electrical signal back into sound waves. An electrical current passes through the coil of wire, creating a magnetic field that pulls the coil of wire and the diaphragm toward the permanent magnet. This rapid movement creates the sound waves that we hear. The average human ear can hear frequencies from about 20 to 20,000 cycles per second or hertz. A single type of speaker cannot reproduce such a broad frequency range, so quality systems have three types of speakers. The tweeter, mid-range, and subwoofer, also known as a woofer. The tweeter reproduces the highest sound frequencies, those in the 3500 to 20,000 hertz range. As the name suggests, the mid-range speakers reproduce sound in the mid-frequency range, about 100 to 3500 hertz. The subwoofer reproduces the low end, or bass sound frequencies, in the 20 to 100 range. Sometimes a speaker called a mid-bass is used to reproduce frequencies in the 100 to 300 hertz range. The output of a speaker is measured in decibels. A decibel is the faintest sound we can hear in the mid-band frequencies. When you're building a high-powered car audio system, here are several other things to consider. First, don't forget about speaker wiring. As a rule of thumb, you should always use the thickest or lowest gauge speaker wire possible to make sure the entire signal is reaching the speakers. Earlier, we talked about the different types of speakers and how they're designed to reproduce different sound frequency ranges. A crossover is a device that's designed to help direct the right frequencies to the proper speakers. For example, it makes no sense for the tweeter to be trying to reproduce low-end sounds and likewise for the subwoofer to be wasting time with vocals. So the crossover acts like a dispatcher, telling which frequencies to go where. There are two types of crossovers, passive and active. Passive crossovers are inexpensive and easy to install. However, they require a lot of power and offer less flexibility and fine-tuning control than active crossovers. 
Active crossovers are more expensive and require a separate amplifier for each band of frequencies you want to separate the signal into. But they offer greater flexibility and are more efficient because they're installed upstream of your amplifier. So the amp isn't wasting power boosting unneeded frequencies. In most high-powered audio systems, you'll find what's called a power line capacitor. Impressing your friends and rattling the windows requires more power than the battery can supply at peak moments. So, the capacitor comes to the rescue. When buying an amplifier, you'll need to be familiar with these terms. Signal-to-noise ratio compares the signal strength to the level of background noise. The higher the decibel number, the better. RMS power stands for root mean square and measures the maximum power an amplifier can produce continuously. Peak power is a measure of the maximum power an amplifier can produce during short bursts. THD stands for total harmonic distortion and represents the amount of change a signal is experiencing as it's being amplified. The lower the number, the better. 